Good morning, everybody. This is Mr. Steele, or good afternoon. For me, it's Saturday. I am not at school today. Um, I'm at an event in Sacramento. Um, but basically, I wanted to still make sure that you guys had your lesson today on Polar Area. So I'm going to be coming to you remotely here and basically trying to give you that lesson as best I can. So just so you know, a couple times I may need to stop during the video. There's been some really strange noises coming from my house, so I'm just trying to keep on top of everything. I've got the dryer going right now. I think that's probably what it was, but I'm just going to try and play it safe the entire time. Just get it there. Like when you live alone, you just always play careful. It could be a cricket. could also be Freddy Krueger. So we're always playing it safe. So anyway, we're here to talk about polar area today. And basically that will wrap up our polar unit or the polar section of our unit on other different types of functions. And basically to begin with, as we start to talk about polar, we have to kind of understand how we're going to come up with that area and comprise that area with tiny little pieces. Because up to this point, whenever we've done areas in calculus, we've always talked about trying to convert everything to a bunch of rectangles. And even though integration will always be based on rectangles, and technically this one still will be, the way we think of the area in terms of polar won't necessarily, will definitely not be rectangular sections. So I'm going to begin by just kind of giving you an idea of where that area formula itself is going to come from show you how that piece works and how it connects to some really basic geometry stuff and what shape it comes from, if not a rectangle. Then we'll go on and do a couple different examples, like one to correspond to each of the different sections that are really out there. Um, there's really, I believe, four different types of uh, region interactions that we might have. And basically, uh, we'll try to make this as fun along the way as possible. And the one nice thing about recording remotely is if someone sighs angrily or you guys do one of your ha reactions to one of my jokes, I can't hear it, so I'll just imagine that you're laughing really, really hard when I'm not there, and you're just secretly keeping all the laughter away when I'm there, which is a strange strategy, but who knows. So anyway, to begin things, as we said, our goal here is going to be able to, by the end of this lesson, compute area, and basically we want to compute area, not just in general, but compute area of polar regions, or of a polar region. And I'm actually looking at the computer screen right now and realizing that, you know what, this pressure sensitive thing isn't working so well. Let me make a quick switch here. I'm going to have to stop the video pretty frequently too just to make sure it doesn't over record. So you'll, hopefully you'll bear with me. So for the moment though, we're trying to compute the area of polar regions. And before we start there, I'm going to start with the geometric piece that's going to lead into our area for polar. And this feels a little bit weird because not every polar curve looks the same. We've even seen like lines in polar. But for the moment, um, hopefully it'll be a good place to start. And the shape I'm going to start with is with a very simple region. Basically, I've just drawn for you a quarter circle. So I've drawn a quarter circle because of the fact that the quarter circle has chunks that can be broken apart in ways that kind of reminisce of the polar region itself, where we basically start with an angle, and then we go out as far as we're supposed to, we figure out the magnitude for that angle, and then we continue until we get to the angle we want to stop at. So in here, what I want to do with this quarter circle is I'm going to first draw just a radius. I'm going to draw this radius and call that radius R. Why not? We can do it pirate style and say that's RR. From here, I'm going to draw a second radius. And since it's a quarter circle, these radii are both the exact same length, so I can call it R as well. And then in the middle, I'm going to define a little angle theta. And it's not that little. I mean, it's a big theta. It's a big theta. But it's a theta just the same right in the middle of that. And what I've created now, and I'm going to sketch or fill it in and then uncolor it so we can actually see it, is basically I've drawn what we like to call, in the math business, a sector. This is one sector of that quarter circle, or what could be a full circle if we had more space. So this is a sector. In fact, that whole thing, why did I write that over there? Winnie and her pen will be upset that I had to move this. Basically, that thing is a sector of a circle. So think of it like our own little pizza slice. In fact, I subtitled this lesson a few years ago before people complained about actual fun titles, because people don't seem to like having fun. And I titled this Pizza Pizza. So think of this as our little slice of pizza. Weird. It looks like somebody screaming, sort of, too. Kind of weird. Um, anyway, so over here, what we want to do is the question we want to answer first, the geometric question, before we can get to polar, is to ask ourselves, what is the area of that sector? So we want to figure out, what is the area of the sector we've just described? So I'm going to say area of sector. And basically, in order to do this, we've got to think about it as proportional to the entire circle. So if we had the full circle all the way around, 
Pretend that's a beautiful circle and not an ugly looking stepped on something. Cow pie, let's go with that. If we had that full circle, that little angle theta would create one small little section of the entire thing. In fact, if we wanted to figure out how much of the circle or how much of the full radians or degrees in the circle it was, we could set up a proportion and say that the angle theta over two pi gives us the proportion of the circle that we're actually looking at. In addition, if we wanted to figure out what proportion that the sector actually is, we could do that by taking the same proportion. We could take the area of the sector and divide it by the entire area of the circle. Those two proportion or those two ratios should be equal because they're proportional, of course. We've taken a proportional section of the circle and a proportional angle of the full 2 pi that comprise the entire circle. And we've got what is a really nice proportional section or proportion. And from there, if we solve that for the thing that we're interested in, we're interested in the area of that little sector. I'll even write it in there correctly. I noticed I didn't in my notes this morning. If we take that area of the sector, that's going to be equal to, if we multiply everything through, like imagine multiplying everything through here by pi r squared. If we multiply that through, we're going to get theta pi r squared. Sorry, I have to lean kind of funny because of the fact that my microphone's in my way. We get pi is theta pi r squared over 2 pi. And if we simplify that, you'll notice that the pi's cancel. I was trying to think of a joke involving a bakery, but you know what? I don't have to impress you today. So instead, I've got what looks like a 2 in the denominator. So I'm going to go ahead and write that as 1 half r squared theta. So basically, there is our actual formula for the area of a sector. Now keep in mind, though, one thing. When we go to do this in polar, we're not going to be talking about gigantic sectors because, of course, the entire graph we have isn't necessarily going to be circular. In fact, let me draw one down here. I'll draw like a nice little general polar curve. So look at that fun little guy. There is our polar curve, and we're going to say that guy has r of theta. There's a polar curve. What we want to do is we want to break this up into little pieces that we can calculate the area of. It turns out, because of the natural curviness of a polar graph, what we can do is break this down into tiny little individual infinitesimally small slices of pizza. We're going to break them up into tiny little sectors. Or, better put, treat this as a series of little sectors that are going to be added together. So in here, I'll even use a different color to make it clear. What we'll do is we'll make a tiny little sector. Of course, i got to actually draw it. Look at the cute little baby sector. Look at the little sector. We'll have it inside. We'll make its little angle d theta so that it's really, really small. Infinitesimally small is good. And then we'll say that we started at the angle alpha. This is our starting alpha or theta angle. This is our finishing alpha angle. And of course, these little radius lengths are describing the same length as the original curve. So in a sense, we could call them r of theta. And since this is an infinitesimally small little angle, r of theta will be basically the same on both sides because we're assuming that we can get things really, really close. Kind of the same way we bring those two points together when we're differentiating for the first time. Basically say, okay, let's pretend that secant line is a tangent line. This is like us saying, basically, that sector is so small, it's like it's a single line. And given that information, if we take all the things together and we remember our formula for the area of a sector is this guy, the area of each of those little individual sectors is going to be 1 half r squared d theta. But let's, let's even be more specific. Since r of theta is going to be the polar curve itself, we'll let this be r of theta squared d theta. And then all we have to do is integrate that guy from theta equals alpha, the first angle, to theta equals beta, the second angle. And the only thing I'd change here before you commit that into your notes is I'd go ahead and throw the one half out in front. Typically you'll see it written that way in textbooks, even in my own notes from before. So basically we have created a way to add up. Well, first of all, we've conceptualized a way to figure out area and polar. We just treat everything as a sector of a circle. And then finally, we add up a whole bunch of tiny little sectors, just like we would tiny little rectangles in terms of rectangular form. And we end up with our formula. Unfortunately, the box is going to be a little tall, but there it is. So this is the thing that you need to know. You need to know that actual formula, be able to calculate it. Remember, there's a one half, all those different things. Um, but again, it's always nice to kind of ground it in something that's a little bit simpler to understand. And remembering that we're just adding up a whole bunch of sections of the circle is a great way to do that. 
So with that in mind, um, let's go ahead and start looking at some examples. Or maybe, I'll, I'll think about it for a second, maybe we'll look at some pictures on Desmos and kind of see this playing into place. Okay, before we go forward, I just wanted to mention one thing. Like before we go too far, I was trying to get everything ready and I went, oh, I forgot to say something. Basically what I want to add in here is one little thing. Basically if there was a way that I could get you to kind of think of this idea in your head, particularly on a day when I'm not actually there to respond to questions and kind of help with things that way, I really wish you could get this idea in your head. Like this is exactly how I finally understood it um, from a couple years ago when I didn't really have a good grasp of it. What I did is I reminded myself, just like I did with integration, where I kept saying to myself, area is just adding up a whole bunch of rectangles. I want you to straight up think of this as you're summing up a bunch of tiny slices. And specifically, there's slices of pizza. So basically, you can think of it as pizza, pizza. But the idea is you're adding up a bunch of tiny slices. So this idea, I think getting that kind of in your head, that this is our new system, this is how we handle polar, is with the sector strategy, I think that that'll really um, add something to what you already understand. So for the moment, I'm going to really quickly go into Desmos and just kind of give you a chance to see this in action and prove to you that this actually does look about right. So what I'm going to do first, is before we graph any of our actual things, I just want to put in some random curve. So I'm going to put r equals theta. Let's see if I can make something kind of funky happen here. So we've got theta plus sine of theta. So in fact, I don't really want the grid line in there. We've seen it before. Let's get rid of the grids. Okay, so in here, what I want to show you is that you can actually see that the sector or that the area in polar or like a certain region of polar represents some or rep looks pretty close, let's say. Let's say it looks pretty close to an actual slice of pizza. So for instance, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the exact same equation that I had before. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Desmos to help me with something. I'm going to tell it to only sketch the region. Oh, no, I can do something more. I'm going to do less than or equal to. So this is a little frustrating at the moment. It's filled the entire screen, as you can probably see. I'm blue. I'm so lonesome for you. OK, so basically, setting aside a little bit of singing, I'm going to say, let's go from the angle pi over 4 less than or equal to theta. That didn't help. Less than or equal to pi over 3. So what I want you to see here is, I mean, it's not like this is a super convincing thing, but just the moment, take a look at the screen and notice that although it's not, we know it's not a circle, we know it's a spiral, it's circular-ish, yeah, yeah, close enough, but what we can tell is that it looks sort of like a sector. You can see the resemblance to a pizza slice. I mean, the most obvious thing in here, the most inapt thing about the description is that those radius lengths aren't the same, but that's because our angles are really, really different. If we squeeze this together, I made this a little bit more, like 1 over, or pi over 4.1 to pi over 4.2. It isn't even showing you anything. Where did it go? Come back. Pi over 4.1 to pi. For some reason, it really doesn't. Oh, it's probably because one's bigger than the other. Sorry, my bad. Hold, please. That's what happens when you wing it in here. There we go. Look at that. That guy's a really small. Imagine we're adding up a whole bunch of those tiny little slices over and over and over again and slowly getting the entire region. As we expand that bigger piece, let's see if I can do that. Let's add a little slider here. As we expand that bigger piece, notice we're just adding more and more slices. Like each one is a tiny little slice. We're just adding a bunch of those guys up until we slowly fill more stuff. And obviously there's an issue that pops up right there. You can see we start to overlap and we'll talk about that issue a little bit later. But for the moment, hopefully you can at the very least believe what I'm saying, that we're adding up a whole bunch of tiny slices of pizza when we go to make this happen. So kind of neat, kind of a neat system. Different kind of system than we've had before, but neat for sure. So with that said, let's jump in and look at our next example. Or our first example. We haven't really done an example yet. So let's do that. Okay, welcome back. So what we want to hit next is we want to start looking at examples here and seeing some things. As I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of different scenarios here. And in particular, calculating polar area is going to feel a little bit different than calculating rectangular area, um, where we always do things like top minus bottom and right minus left, because of the fact that there's this new like non-uniqueness that happens with polar, where certain points represent multiple things. Lots of interesting things can happen. So I've really broken it down into cases and different shapes or different situations that might happen, visually speaking. I started with kind of the simplest, and then I'm going to move on to slightly more difficult ones. And what's going to help you every single time is to kind of separate all of those like shapes and kind of draw out a little representative pizza slice. As long as you're not hungry, it should be fine. It should be really helpful. So our first move. The first situation that we have is what I'd call the simplest. It's basically when you have just a single curve 
and you're looking for a particular region within that single clean curve. And by clean, I mean that the overlaps are really nice. You're on a small region, you're on a small window or a small set interval of theta. You're just looking at something clean. So in our first example here, you are going to be asked to find the area, or we are going to gather, like even if we're doing it remotely across time, weird. We are going to find the area enclosed by the inner loop of this particular graph, negative four root three plus eight sine of theta. So an interesting shape for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, but basically if we use um, some of the information we've had before, and really when I'm saying all these things, I'm just buying time for you to write down the problem while using time valuably too, for those of you that don't take notes. Basically, as I think about what shape this is, I'm expecting that this will, let's see, it won't be a rose curve because we've got that something. Rose curves are always just something sine of n theta or cosine of n theta. It's not gonna be a circle because those don't have that extra addition either. What I'm expecting this to be is not a cardioid because then those two numbers would be the same, eight and negative four root three are not the same number. So I'm guessing this is probably a limacin. This is probably gonna be one of those kidney beans or as someone in I think second period pointed out, I think it was crispy, goes, it's a butt. So yeah, that, like that's probably what we have. And a quick Desmos check here, just to make sure, shows us that in fact, it does look like we have a limacin. There's our little inner loop. And if memory serves, the question asks us to find the area enclosed by the inner loop. So our job is to figure out the area of that tiny little thing, like that, I don't know, balloon, or that snowshoe, whatever it might be. So we're trying to figure out the area of that little region. So to get there, the nice thing here is this is the cleanest of the problems that we can possibly attack with. Basically, all we have to do is kind of combine some of those pieces we had before, um, or that we set up earlier in this unit. What our strategy is going to involve is basically figuring out where this curve actually crosses itself to figure out kind of the angular bounds for that region. Well, there's that word. Figure out the angular bounds of this region, like we kind of practiced on that first polar day. Then we'll use our graphing calculator to check. I'll have to find mine. It's somewhere around here. At least I thought I put it here, but whatever. Um, we'll probably find our calculator to check. Then we'll just use our new formula and then allow our calculator to do the heavy lifting. Truthfully speaking, as you'll see, a lot of these integrals we could do by hand, but we just don't want to. And I don't want you to use your time for that. I'd rather have you thinking conceptually about it and setting stuff up than wasting your time doing more trig integrals. I feel like you already paid that piper. So here, let's start with a nice plan, especially since I'm not there, to answer questions as we go. Let's get some stuff in here. We could have you choose a color, but that would be difficult seeing as you aren't here. I'm sure you're turning off pressure sensitive. So our first step is going to be to figure out the actual bounds for where we are. So I'm gonna write it over here as we wanna find the minimum or the minimal magnitude angular bounds. And in particular, the positive angular bounds. Just nice to go with positive. And again, it's been a few days. I think it's probably like four days since we talked about this whole idea. The idea is what we're trying to figure out and take advantage of is that when this graph graphs out, what happens is we're looking for the place where it comes back and hits zero and then hits zero again because those would be the likely places where our region starts and stops. So that's going to be our strategy. We're going to try to figure out the minimum magnitude angular bounds. So in here, the way we did that last time was we recognize that that usually happens at the pole or the origin. So we're going to set r equal to zero. And in this case, to quote a great pirate I once knew, rr is negative four root three plus eight sine of theta. So we need to figure out when is that equation equal to zero? For what theta will that be? And we'll pick the two smallest positive ones. So doing a little bit of work here, we're gonna add four root three over to the right side and divide by eight. I'm gonna do some of these steps a little bit faster just to save time. Maybe we can even sneak in a set of commercials. I think we can. Basically that means sine of theta is going to be positive four root three over eight, which is the same thing as root three over two. And that's nice. We can do a quick little picture of some stuff. Sine's positive in quadrants one and two. So we're expecting those angles to be up there. And if sine is root three over two, that means that we have a 60 degree reference angle. So in fact, I would expect in our case that theta, well, hold on, I'm just gonna move this over. I should be using space better because I'm writing a lot larger. In our case, theta should be equal to the two 60 degree reference angles in quadrants one and two, which would be pi over three and two pi over three. So we have our two minimum magnitude, magnitude angular bounds. So before we do anything else, I just wanna check. And I don't have my graphing calculator here. I thought it was here, but I don't know. I've been, things have been disappearing on me. It's been a really weird day the last 24 hours. It's been really strange here. Um, but anyway, I'll use Desmos and just check to see, does this look like the correct region? And I don't actually know if Desmos will do this for me, but 
hopefully. So let's see. So I'm going to take this guy in, and I only want to look at it from pi over 3. That didn't do much. To 2 pi over 3. And look at that. That, hopefully it's that way I'm pointing in the correct direction. That is definitely our little inner loop. So <laughs> I'm not wearing a suit so that doesn't do anything. I think that that's a good sign. It looks like we found the correct region, which again, you could do on your graphing calculator and just check to see and confirm like, yeah, I did it. Good job, me. So that was our first step. So we checked it. And in fact, I want to write that in there as something we can do. So we'll put that in as step two. We're going to say check. And we're going to say we're going to do that on the calculator. Hope you like my rendition of a calculator. Very nice. So we checked on our calculator. Turned out it worked. So I don't know. When I was in high school and doing math homework, I'd always, every time those problems said, check your answer, I'd go, okay. I did. Thought I was really clever. Maybe I was. Maybe Mr. Richmond laughed the whole time. We'll never know. I guess I could ask him, but yeah, I won't. So from there, the cool thing is, that was all the hard work. That was all the work that we had to do. All that's left is to actually use the formula we already had to take advantage of the fact that we've already understood or conceptualized the idea that area and polar is adding up a whole bunch of tiny little slices of pizza. And those tiny little slices of pizza are added up by taking one half the integral from the first angle to the second angle of r squared d theta. I couldn't see the screen, so it's kind of tough. So that's all we have to do is we have to plug it into that formula. So in our case, we know what r is. r is just the equation of the curve, whatever it happens to be. It's going to represent kind of our radius in this case. d theta is just to allow us to let it change according to or with respect to theta. And then alpha and beta are exactly what we just found. Like that's exactly what we're doing with the minimum magnitude angular bounds. We're restricting and figuring out what part of the region for what angles will we have the region we're looking for. So in our case, we can actually set up an integral for the actual area of this curve by doing half the integral from pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. It'll be of r, which is negative 4 root 3 plus 8 sine of theta squared d theta. And this is the area of our region. And at this point, like you can feel pretty good because that's really the heaviest lifting of the problem. For our purposes, though, Basically, we would then be asking you to, in step four, we would want you to actually tell us, like, well, okay, cool, you got it, you got the integral. What is the actual area? So basically, step four would be to evaluate your integral. But let me warn you that although you can totally evaluate this integral simply by multiplying it all out and then applying trig identities and using trig integral strategies like we did in chapter seven, I'm not going to ask you to do that at any point. Maybe if I write a plus test, probably won't get to for this unit, but if I do, that might be the only place where I'd ask you to calculate one by hand. You can kind of see and anticipate that this one would require a power reducing identity because we'd end up with a sine squared. But you know what? We already did that test. So instead, all we'll need to do is we're going to, in almost every case, evaluate on a calculator. So we'll pull out a calculator and spit out the answer. And I have Desmos ready, so let me go ahead and pull it up there. We might as well throw it in there and remind you that you can do cool stuff on Desmos this way. So I'll have one hell, one half, one health, one health. <laughs> Not that sick. We'll go from pi over three to two pi over three. We're going to do our integral. It was negative four square root of three plus eight sine of theta. It'll be squared. And we'll have d theta. And it tells me that our area is right here. It's 0 0.319. 0 0.319. So we have now calculated the area. And that area is pretty small, but that kind of makes sense. Like, just remember, we looked at that picture a second ago. If we look at the full thing, let's see if we can get rid of those guys. Like, this is not, this is not a very big a pretty small little thing. I mean, it's a tiny little thing compared to everything else. So it doesn't surprise me that answer is fairly small. We found a fairly small area of a very small region. So everything sounds good. And basically for the simplest problems, the area of the inside of a limacin, maybe the area of a single petal of a rose curve, that's a pretty easy one. Those ones you're just doing kind of the same process. Finding the angles that bound the region, setting up the integral, and then evaluating using a graphing calculator because I'm a reasonable person. I'm not going to ask you to do it by hand. 
So with that said, that's been kind of a long run. Like we've already a little ways into this thing. Like we're a couple minutes in. How about we take a quick, how about we take a pause for a commercial break? Like that should break up the monotony a little bit. So please hold for, um, please hold while we have a word with our sponsors. No, while we have the word. I'm going to have to figure out the script on this thing. I should have thought that through a little bit more. A question that sometimes drives me hazy. Am I or are the others crazy? Well, Einstein, I have found the answer to that question today. Everyone else is crazy since I, company CEO, am the first to tap into the market of pawns. Have you ever found your chess sets missing pieces necessary for playing the game? Yeah, I'm missing a pawn in- Well, look no further. Company name has the pawns for you. Here at Company Name, we make only pawns so you can kill them off so you can play with all your fancy pieces. Wait, what? Only pawns? No one even likes those. Numbers. Using revolutionary, proprietary, polyorganic amazophate, we are the first company ever to engineer corn-based plastic pawns exclusively. Just pawns, nothing else. How does this even work? Is this real? It doesn't matter. Starting at $4.20, you can get a set of 8 pawns delivered to your doorstep through Amazon Prime, or 69 pawns at $42.42. Company name! Wait, am I getting a patient for this? In the end, we're all society's pawns. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we just looked at our first example, kind of the simplest version. I said there's that single curve crossing itself. We already knew how to kind of find those angular bounds. Let's take a look at our second example. You know, it's honestly kind of bothering me that the dryer is still going, but so it goes. Yeah, we should be... Wait, do you guys see that? <laughs> is that cuddles? Weird. It's not Cuddles. It's his celebrity impersonator, or what do you call it, his, you know, the guy that pretends to be him at public appearances so he doesn't get mobbed. But that's weird that he would be sitting on the floor outside of the study, considering the fact that I didn't put him there. Like I said, it's been a weird week. It's been a weird weekend. It's just been a weird couple days. So do you have anything you could tell me? Okay, well, we'll keep him close by, try to figure out what's going on a little bit later. Um, should be fine. Haven't been any weird noises lately, just the mysterious appearance of a stuffed seal. Hmm, Winnie? <laughs> Can't be. She doesn't know where I live. We're fine. We're good. Okay, so back to the actual math that we're doing here. What we want to figure out is we want to start to look at some other regions, some other more difficult situations that might pop up. And although um, we've got this new one coming up, we're trying to find the area between two curves. So as it says up there in step two, this is cleanly between two curves. As in there's no intersections between the two curves. There's just one region, and what am I? I'm making it look like this. There's one region inside of another region. Basically no touching. So in this case, our first one, we want to find the area between the graphs of the polar functions, r equals four, and r equals 3 sine of 5 theta. So that's where we're going to begin our second attack. So as we think about these guys for a second and try to picture what the graphs look like, I always encourage you to think about what parent shapes we might end up with. And I think the first one is the easiest one to kind of grab and to think about. r equals 4 would just be a circle. It's a distance of 4 around for all angles theta. It's not even, it's independent of theta, honestly. The second one, though, we have 3 sine of 5 theta. Do you remember what kind of shape that was? Anybody? Yes, you're right. That would be a rose curve. And how many petals would it have with that odd number on the inside? You're right, five. I bet there were people that actually answered even though I'm not here. If there were, smile and laugh. That should be fun. Okay, so let's just go check really fast. Let's go check to see what we're talking about as well as confirm what I said that this is cleanly between two curves. So in here we had r equals four. Look at that, a nice circle. Everything looks good there. And then second, three sine of five theta. Notice that this is exactly what we, what we should have expected. We have a five petaled rose curve, because again, the odd coefficient on the inside produces one to one petal, one petal for each odd number that's there. And then we have a circle of radius four. 
And I said that this second example is when we're cleanly between two curves, meaning that these two curves don't intersect. Notice there's no place where these guys cross. So there's nothing that tough that we really have to attack with. We just have two curves. And what we're looking for is the area inside here. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this really easily on our page. Yeah, it covers up the inside. So the only thing I can think of, oh, you know what I know what I can do. I can quickly go steal this guy. Ha, huh, steal it. Look at that, I'm funny even when I'm not trying. I can go paste this in here. Go into Word or into MS Paint, good old favorite. And then I can fill this with a light red color. Boom, boom, boom. So we did want the area between those two curves and that would be my impression. That's what I think we're looking for, is the area of the sand dollar part that's outside of those pieces. Really, we're gonna play this game, okay. There, square. So there is the region that we're looking for. I'm gonna put it somewhere down here. Gotta avoid the part where I'm putting this video. So there it is, everything in place. Good, 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 good. So now, with that in mind, the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna actually throw our pen on the floor. wonder why the door rang. I'll be right back. Let me go take a look at that. I'm sure it's fine. So, there's no one at the door. <laughs> um, I think someone must be playing a prank on me because this is what I found at the door. And notice the like slanted eyebrows on there. So it's like a sly, evil kind of grin. Yeah, this is really funny. Like, if this is Winnie or somebody else, um, <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's just tell them this is actually a little bit creepy. Like, especially with the seal appearing earlier. But I think it's probably gonna be okay. I'm laughing nervously. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's just do a little bit of math and let's just, let's just like, let's, we're coming to do more math. Let's assume that's what this means and that there's nothing bad there and it's not in a creepy head right I've never seen before. So anyway, anyway, let's look at what happens when we're trying to calculate an area cleanly between two curves. And we already saw the picture. It's right down here. Sorry, there it is. It's right down there. We want to figure out the area of the region between those two. And we had from our previous page, if we go up there, we go up, do, 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 do. copy, let's make that a little bit smaller, it's kind of large right now, like my heart rate as I think about that ridiculous note that was left on my doorstep. It basically starts by finding the minimum magnitude angular bounds, and now this is where it's kind of a little bit interesting, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves, because we now have two different angles for us to go through. So before I even start there, I just want to try to write out kind of verbally and conceptualize exactly what it is that we're going to be doing here to calculate the area. Because with two shapes in here, although we're used to doing like outside versus inside, it's not going to actually work out that way. We need to instead think of these as two separate regions and then work with them from there. So to start with, where I want to begin is by pointing out that the area that we're looking for in this case is going to be the area of the circle since that really is, I mean, just looking down at that picture, you can see right here, it's the area of the circle, basically. But what we're gonna do is we're going to be removing the area inside of the rose curve, basically. And the way I want you to think about this, that some of you are gonna ignore, and you're gonna be like, the answer comes out fine, and you're gonna be right for a while until you take your test and you see the question I have to beat that system, but I set that aside. What you're gonna do then is you're gonna think about it in the simplest form. Basically, we can easily calculate the area of one single petal. In fact, we've been preparing for that. Even our first example with the limestone is very similar to calculating the area of a single petal of a rose curve. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to ask us to take the circle and then subtract not just one petal, but all five petals. And since all five petals are symmetrical, I'm gonna ask you to take the circle and subtract five petals worth of area. And that will give us the area of the region that we're actually looking for. And the cool thing here is that when we look at it in this way, the first part of this problem is really easy. The area we're looking for, if we want to talk about the circle, 
that circle has area four, or has radius four. And the area of a circle with radius four is just going to be pi r squared. So the first part of this problem doesn't require any actual intense work. We already know how to calculate the area of a circle. We don't know who left that note, but we do know the area of a circle. So from there, we'll start there. From there, we do know how to subtract five, but we don't know what the area of a single petal is yet. So in a sense, our problem now boils down into just figuring out what is the area of a single petal of that particular rose curve. And we have done that before. We want to figure out where that three sine of five theta crosses itself. So we need to figure out where does three sine of five theta equals zero. And again, we'll check this in a second. We'll follow the steps of the plan pretty faithfully. So from there, I can of course divide by three. That will give me sine of five theta equals zero. And then again, as I think about sine, sine equals zero when the angle inside is either zero or pi or two pi or three pi or any of those things. So in a sense, that means we want our argument, five theta in this case, to equal zero or pi. And now technically I know it always says find the minimum magnitude angu positive angular bounds. We can allow zero. Zero is really easy to work with. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow that too. And that means if we divide everything we have by five, we'll get that those minimum magnitude angular bounds are theta equals zero divided by five, which is zero, and theta equals pi over five. So we have our minimum magnitude angular bounds. That works out really, really nicely. From there we said we check. Let's just go check. Let's make sure we get a single petal. There's no real downside to not doing that. So over here it already goes from zero to pi. Let's try zero to pi over five. Look at that, that looks like a single petal if I ever saw one. Something's going well. So I think we're in really good shape. From there looking back, so we already checked. Sorry, I'll draw my little check mark so I feel good. I feel like I satisfied what I was supposed to. Check. The third step is just to put it into the integral. Now keep in mind, we're not actually calculating the area of the region we're looking for. We're just calculating the area of a single petal. Single petal, very easy for us to do. It's the standard process, so let's figure that out. In fact, I'm gonna be really explicit here. I'm gonna say area of one petal is equal to our area formula. And as we said, we're adding up a bunch of tiny little sectors, tiny little slices of pizza, yum, yum. Pizza, pizza. For our purposes, I realize when I say pizza, pizza, it almost sounds like pika, pika but that's okay, my bad. Our integral is gonna range from zero to pi over five. Our radius is going to be three sine of five theta squared, of course, because it's one half r squared theta. And then of course, we'll end with d theta. And again, we can go to Desmos to calculate this value. I could just look at my paper, but this always just buys you a little bit of time. If we do half the integral from zero to pi over five, or one fifth pi of three sine of five theta squared d theta. It tells us the area of a single slice is 1.3, oh, that's cool, it highlights, 1.413716694412. So there is the area of a single slice, or a single petal of the rose curve. So let's go pop that in there really fast. We calculate our area, each petal, is 1.4137. And again, on my graphing calculator, I'd just be saving that. I'd just store that as something like maybe A or something. That's a pretty common value to store it as. But now that allows us to go back up to our original equation and point out what we're trying to calculate. I want the entire thing. Oh, you know what? I just realized I should have made that pink. Oh, well, too late. Pretend it's pink. So basically what we've got is we've got our individual petal area. We already knew the area of the circle. So if we go back to the original piece we were trying to calculate, or actually let's go to the evaluation. The area of the region we desire is going to be equal to 16 pi for the pi 4 squared. And then it's going to be minus 5 times that thing, as we wrote up at the very top. And if we simplify those pieces, it's going to be approximately equal to a very unsatisfying 43.197. And again, that's our area it rounded to the nearest thousand. And so once again, not bad, but again, this was a little bit different. If you're thinking in the mindset of old school integration, rectangle style, rectang rectangle, rectangle style, you'd be thinking top minus bottom or maybe even outside minus in. In this case, it doesn't work that way. We just have to separate it into two discrete pieces and calculate the areas that way. And in fact, you'll notice with polar stuff, it always works that way. We're always separating it out into individual regions. You'll never just do like big R minus little r squared. It never fits into that form. 
So try not, try your best not to expect that. So that hits section number two. And you know what, what the heck? Let's do one more, let's do a single more region. Like let's, or let's, no, single more region. Let's have one more commercial break. In fact, I think this one will be pretty cool. I've been working on this one for a little while. So we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that commercial. We've still got a couple little situations left, really just one more situation that we want to hit, and then we're going to um, take a look at one last example using a calculator and like probably call it a day. Everything should be good. But again, that Cuddles movie that you saw in that commercial, coming tomorrow. So let's go forward to the next example. So the third situation is the most involved. It's the most difficult, but in reality, I don't think it's that difficult to actually do. It's really just kind of difficult to conceptualize and kind of begin and kind of see how things work if you're not really comfortable with the pizza slice strategy that we've been using. So the third situation, as it says right there, is the common interior with intersecting curves. So basically up to this point, we've avoided the issue of two different curves actually intersecting each other, um, but now we're finally ready to kind of attack that moment. And it says we need to find the area of the common interior between two sine of theta and r equals the square root of two. So I know that second one is gonna be a circle, the first one I believe is also a circle, but they're gonna to have to intersect in some way. So let's start things off by graphing this on Desmos and kind of getting a sense for what this thing actually looks like. Let's see here. So that was our old one. Let's take a look here. We want r equals, was it two? Two sine of theta. So there's our first circle. Wow, isn't it lovely? Our second one will be r equals square root of two. So there's our second circle. And what it says here is we want the area of the common interior. And once again, I think probably the best thing for us to do is to use good old MS Paint and just kind of visualize what it is we're looking for here. Do, 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 do. We want the common interior. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. Here, hold on. Let me just go take a look. I have a feeling there's like a spring load or something. So this has been one of those nights where everything seems to be weird. So um, <laughs> I think we're okay though. I think I think that was just the spring load. I've been having trouble with that for a while. So ah, okay, we're back to normal. We're back here. Common interior. So we're looking at the common interior of this thing. So let's um, let's go. Um, Let's go, God, I'm just kind of creaked out. <sighs> okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Common interior, I can do this, common interior. Okay, so we've highlighted the common interior on here. Let's go pop it into our problem 
set here and get it all squeezed together. So there is our common interior here. <laughs> wow, sometimes things get really, really creepy. Whew. Okay, I'm sure it's all fine. So here we go, here we go. We're going to go ahead and draw this in. So looking at my screen, sorry, I gotta lean to the side a little bit to get this in. Basically what I wanna do is I want us to actually visualize what the, God, I got this creepy feeling there's something behind me. I don't wanna look. I need to look. There's definitely nothing there. There's nothing there. <laughs> when you get paranoid, you get paranoid. Okay, back to the thing. I'm just gonna like, whew, whew. okay. So looking at our region, what I want you to think about here is the idea of drawing a bunch of pizza slices through this graph. So basically think about it this way. We've got our region in here that we're trying to go through. What we wanna do is we wanna actually think about this as where the pizza slice would be. And what I wanna to try to do is try to sketch out a couple pizza slices for you. So basically looking at the graph so far, if I'm drawing out these pizza slices, supposedly all coming from the exact same region, what you can see is we end up in the very beginning of this region, up to that first intersection point, which occurs right here. We end up with a whole bunch of pizza slices, but they're only related to the curve right there. Basically, more than anything else, we've just got pizza slices going towards the purple circle. In fact, if I was smart, I would use purple to do this. Sorry, I'm a little off my game, just with everything in, huh, creepiness of living alone, God. So basically you can imagine we get these little pizza slices here. I'm using purple to make them a little bit clearer. And up to that first intersection point, all of our pizza slices are bounded only by the purple circle. Guys, nothing there. Jeez, get over yourself. So we've got that purple slice region. Now in the second part though, right past that region, something that's kind of interesting is after that, if we draw a pizza slice out, all our pizza slices in the middle are going out to the black circle. So we're just going out here. So they're bounded not by the purple circle in any way, but just by the black circle. So in this case, we have another set of slices, but coming from the black one. So everything seems pretty good so far. Everything's going well. But then once we reach that second intersection point, now we've got purple region once again. So we're back to using the purple circle itself. All our little mini sectors and pizza slices are all right over there. Everything seems to be fine. So we're going well, but what we've got to see is in a sense, this region actually corresponds to three separate individual. God, I have to stop this. I have this feeling that there's someone there and there's nobody there. God, jeez, I'm fine, I'm fine. So anyway, when you get that idea in your head, it just sticks. Oh man, it sticks. Like I hope this integralized stuff idea sticks. So we'll, we're okay, we're all fine. Okay, so we've got three separate integrals to think of. First, we're going to be doing the integral or basically let's separate it into an area equation. The area we want is going to be the area of the purple part. Let's go purple, not perp. Hopefully there's no perp in my house. Perp on the right. Okay. We have purple on the right. Then second, we're going to add, we're going to add, shoot, I gotta think of that. I got black already, okay. We're gonna add the area of the black section in the middle. Everything, got that, oh, I'm still feeling it. Black in middle, let's get this right, in middle. And then third, we're going to have the area of the purple on the left. So basically what we have to think about here is that we have three separate integrals that we've got to actually hit. We've got to hit the purple one, then the black one, then the purple one. Although I will point out that it looks to me like this region and this region are both going to actually be symmetrical. It looks like they have the same area. So we're probably gonna be able to use some symmetry there. We'll play it safe at the beginning, but let's just keep that in mind. So at this point, we've got those three pieces, but what we're missing is we need to figure out where they intersect. We need to know where the intersections are because those are gonna be the places or the angles where we split up our sections into different parts. So let's go figure out that portion first. So we need to know the angular bounds in a sense. In this case, they're not really bounds, they're really angular intersections, but we can figure that out the same way. And the way we're gonna do that is by taking our equation for the first part and setting it equal to the second part. 
that we'll be able to actually figure out the angles where they're the same. So from here, what that means is that sine of theta is equal to root 2 over 2, which means that our intersections, and let's, we'll see if these make sense overall. Wait. I got this creepy feeling I just saw something over my shoulder. I'm going to look. I'm sure there's nothing there, but I got to look. I have to look. Okay, we're okay. So where were we? Oh yeah, we were trying to find the angular intersection. So we're trying to figure out whether those two graphs have the same value. We were looking for sine equal to root two over two. So if we think about positive sine values, they occur in quadrant one and quadrant two. I'm thinking pi over four and three pi over four. And looking at our picture, those look pretty reasonable. Pi over four looks really, really good. Three pi over four looks really, really good. And it seems like everything else is good to go there. Like we've got everything between 3 pi over 4 and pi over 4. So there are our bounds. Now with that in mind, let's look at each of the individual reasons. Like in a sense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my integrals. Let's make sure I got this right. I'm going to set up my integrals. So I've got all three pieces in place. I'm going to begin with the integral for the region on the right. So that's going to be right here. And basically what I'm thinking is that my region is going to begin right there at 0. And then it's going to move up all the way until we reach pi over 4. So keep in mind, like right up there when we're looking, it's going to be pi over 4 that we're looking at. So I'm going to, based on that, actually here, let's do this. We'll do the integral symbol. Then we'll do, we'll add to that the second integral symbol for the black region. Everything should be fine. And then third, we'll do the integral symbol for, do the third integral symbol. Something. No, I'm fine. I'm not going to even think about it. I'm just not going to think about it. God, this has been a, oh, it's a tense day. Okay, so we've got our three sections for each of the three integral regions. Everything seems to be fine. We should be good there. From there, I'm going to figure out the actual angular bounds based on what we just calculated. So for the first one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that region from 0 to pi over 4. That feels like it's about right. Just looking at my picture, that seems pretty good. For the middle region, we're running from pi over 4, it looks like, all the way over to 3 pi over 4. So I'm going to put pi over 4 up to 3 pi over 4. And then finally for the last one, this is where it gets a little bit tough, but thinking about the angles we have, it looks like we're coming right back to pi. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this region runs from 3 pi over 4 to pi. Before I get too crazy, though, I'm going to go ahead and just check this on Desmos. Let's see if this is actually even working. So let's go in there one more time. We want to check to make sure that our circle is actually running from just 3 pi over 4 to pi. So let's see, 3 pi over 4 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi. Does that give us, did I type anything in? Nope, I divided by something. That's what happens when you're kind of having a shaky day. So we want to go from 3 pi over 4. We want to go less than or equal to theta. And we want to go less than or equal to pi. Does that give us the region we wanted? We wanted that section. In fact, if we go less than or equal to, notice it literally colors the section that we were looking for. Okay, good. So we're in really good shape. It's literally coloring the section we wanted. So I think we're doing everything right. And just for the sake of argument, let's see if this one does go from pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. And let's do the less than or equal to. Let's confirm that this is actually doing what we want it to. Look at that. There it is. It's actually a perfect rendition of what we're looking for. Things are finally starting to look up. I'm not nervous for the first time in a while. This feels really, really good. So the other section was from 0 to pi over 4. Let's do this. And although the coloring's wrong, I can go fix that really fast. Problems I can fix. Not my nerves, but this. And look at that. There is exactly the region that we've been looking for. Everything seems to be going perfectly well. Everything's good. We've got everything in place. Finally. Okay, so now we're ready to go actually set up the rest of these integrals. We just have to make sure we choose the right section for each one. So first going through and adding my one-halves. Each one of these guys is going to have a one-half. Nothing's changed there. For the purple section, we have the 2 sine of theta graph. So 2 sine of theta, sine of theta squared. The other one will be 2 sine of theta squared as well. And then finally, the middle region is going to be 1 half. And our middle black section was r equals root 2. So it'll just be root 2 squared. That'll be the easiest one for us to calculate. And so we have our three integrals set. 
looking at our pieces then, I can go ahead and just tell you, let's look down for a second and see, okay, the final area is going to, interestingly enough, be equal to 2.142, or close to that, and as it turns out, the exact value is actually going to be pi minus one. So interestingly enough, we can get our exact value. So in order to do that though, just to kind of recap where we're at in this particular section with this particular problem, what we have to do is we have to think of intersection as kind of crossing from two angles and then separating us into two separate sections. Like we have two separate parts that we have to add. We create an integral for each one, then we add up those integrals together to get the area of the entire thing. There's never any top minus bottom or outside minus inside like we've had before. Instead, it's just basically getting separate regions of everything. Kind of like we did before with the um, subtraction, except in this case we're adding. So everything is always just adding pieces together. So a little bit different, a little bit more interesting, um, but definitely a different style of work. Um, I highly recommend drawing those little sections out. And when you're first beginning, Desmos really helps you visualize to make sure you've got everything in the right place. So with that said, um, our third example is kind of there. I just want to do one more example with this last section to kind of help it out, especially because I know my instruction has been a little bit choppy in this one because I've just been really nervous. It just feels really weird tonight, um, but I'm sure everything's okay. So give me just a second. We'll start that last one up. Okay, welcome back. Um, took a quick sip of water. Didn't find anything in there. So I think I'm just like, it's one of those days where you're just kind of like thinking about stuff and feeling things. So anyway, I said I wanted to do one more example and it's basically the same idea here. Like I feel like my nerves have kind of hit me on that for last example. So I want to really clearly explain one last example that uses the same idea of like the common interior and the intersecting curve. So I want to make sure everything comes together and works really nicely. So we've got the common interior of intersecting curves done once. Now we're going to use one that involves a little bit more of a calculator. Like this is something that comes up a lot because usually these are calculator questions anyway. So it's something you might want to be prepared for as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the area of the shaded region that's right up there. And this one actually is fairly difficult, but it uses some of the same strategies that we've used before. So I just want to think this through. Um, and even when I said this is the same as the last one, I'd say it's a little bit different than the last one. And like all of these things can feel a little bit different, but using the idea of the pizza slice will really, really help. So to begin with, the first thing I want to do, the first thing I want to do is I just want to make sure that we can visualize what it is we're trying to create here. Because once again, kind of having an idea of what our region looks like is going to be a really essential piece. So basically here, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to draw out what it looks like the regions are. So in a sense, we're looking for the shaded region and we're kind of stuck in that case. If I draw a single one of these little things, I end up with something that has two separate regions in it. And we said before that there's no way for us to actually figure out how to do like the top minus bottom or outside minus in. It just doesn't work with these examples. So instead, what I wanna do is I wanna think about this in two separate pieces. I wanna think about it as first, I need to figure out all the area of this pink region or the region that's going towards the blue curve this whole time, all the way out until we hit the intersection point. And then after that, I wanna subtract from that this is kind of an interesting thing. I want to subtract from that the area that's in here. So basically the same thing, following the same pattern. So we're going over the same exact interval, but instead we've got two separate curves for us to actually look at. So it's going to be kind of interesting. Let me try to conceptualize that for us. I'm going to go ahead and shrink this and try to give me a little bit of room. See if I can make this small enough. There we go. So there's our region that we need to go with. So using my colors, I should use blue and green, I apologize. It's okay, I always make jokes about color blindness anyway, so I'm sure it's fine. So let's see here. We've got first for our area, we are going to figure out, and you know what, I'll actually use, I'll use red. We're gonna figure out the area of the blue curve. Where are we at? God, I can't even see here. Okay. We've got the area for the blue curve that we're going to subtract. God, is there, is there someone behind me? There's no one behind me, right? <sighs> it comes back. So anyway, looking at our pieces here, we've got this blue area. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out the area in red. In fact, I'll just do this. We'll do red area right now. We'll do red area. And then on that interval, whatever it is, up to the intersection point. And then second, we are going to subtract from that the area in green. 
So basically that way we'll have covered everything in the same region. We'll just have made sure to subtract the two things separately. So that should be a really good plan of attack. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and set up the integrals themselves. That's usually a good way to go. So that way I've got the area calculation almost ready to go. So first we're going to have the integral on that side. It'll be one half of the outer function. Hmm. Oh, and you know what? I can tell some stuff here. So looking at these shapes, this is a circle. So I'm telling that this one has to be the one on the outside, the one that we're using as we go through here. So that's really helpful. That means my first integral is going to be two sine of theta squared, or one half the integral of two sine of theta squared d theta. And then second, I'm gonna go ahead and subtract from that the green part, which is going to be one half the integral of the other part, which would be the spiral. I'm guessing that this graph is going to spiral around like that over and over and over again, like the way my nerves are spiraling out of control this entire night, just kind of all creeped out. So we're spiraling that one. So this is going to be one half the integral of, should, I shouldn't do that, I almost made a spiral myself, theta squared d theta. And then that will kind of cover everything that we actually need. We should be in good shape then. So from here, I've got almost everything ready. I've got a nice concept of what the area is going to actually come out to be. But now I've got a problem myself. I don't actually have any idea where these things intersect. I used a green. I want black. Do, 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 do. There it is. So I want to figure out, I don't know what that angle is. What is theta right there? We don't actually know. Like looking at our picture, I feel confident that both of these integrals are going to start at zero. Just from looking at my picture and knowing that this is zero, I feel like both of these pieces kind of begin at zero. There it was, sorry. Something weird happened on the computer right there. Um, both of those things seem to be starting at zero, so I should be good there. But I know what the intersection is. So at that point, it'd be that moment where we go, really, we need to solve an equation. We did that last time too. We need to figure out where those two curves cross, so we need to know when does two sine of theta equal theta. Problem is, we don't have a good way to solve that equation. We have a line on one side and we have a sine curve on the other. So unfortunately, what that means is we need to switch modes. Like we've done this a few times before. We just need to move out of the one mode and move into the other. So in a sense, we're gonna switch modes and we're going to instead solve when does two sine of x equal x. So I don't have a graphing calculator handy. It disappeared a while ago, so I'm sure we'll find it eventually. But I can, of course, switch modes on Desmos as well. So I'm gonna put in y equals two sine of x, and then I'm gonna put in y equals x, and we're looking for an intersection point, and based on the picture that we had in there, that intersection point looks like it's happening in somewhere quadrant two-ish, so let's make sure that our angle is in quadrant two. So again, we're in y x mode right now. The x coordinate itself, it looks like it's 1.895, so I'm gonna go ahead and write that down. I'm hoping that that's it. It's the only intersection point, so it should be good. So in that case, we got x is approximately, what did I say, 1.895. Got that in my notes, thankfully. And so, of course, if x is approximately 1.895, that's the same thing as saying that's when theta is approximately 1.895. So a quick little thinking through this one through, or thinking this one through, blah, blah, blah. If we think this one through, the angle should be in quadrant two. If this is pi over two up here, then that's about 1.57. If this is pi down here, that's like 3.14. So 1.895 should actually fall in that region. So I think we're in really good shape. So I feel good about that one. So I'm going to make my region do exactly that. This first one is gonna run from zero to 1.895. Second, the other one, which is on the exact same region, I'm gonna also run from zero to 1.895. Now the only thing left is I just need to figure out actually if I have the correct individual Areas. So I want to see if this area comes out positive, if this makes sense. So I'm going to punch this in on the computer, or on Desmos once again. Sorry, I keep flipping to Desmos. I feel like I'm cheating because I don't have a calculator with me. Someday I'll find it. 0 to 1.895. And the first one was 2 sine of theta squared d theta. And then I'm going to add to that 1 half the integral. One of those times when you wish you had it. Oh, shoot, I said add. We turned out we had to subtract it. We were just going to take the bigger one minus the smaller one. So we're going to go 0, 2, Let's go 1.895. Sorry, I get that creepy feeling again, but I know better. I'm not going to look anymore. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to keep plowing through here. 
d theta. So from there, it looks like my area turns out to be whatever's right down there. I've got 1.062, okay. Then we've got 1.0627, which means it looks like my area in this region is approximately 1.063. So that seems like a reasonable answer. It also matches exactly what I had in my notes. So this feels like a pretty good strategy. It feels like everything's, feels like everything's good to go. Um, all I need to do then is just kind of wrap up this lesson. So give me just a second to set this up and save this file and then I'll come right back and we'll finish everything up. Call it a night and then I'm just gonna go to bed and just call it a night or play Spiral the Dragon. Play the friggin' gems, all gems level of Spiral the Dragon. Something that's like pure fun so that, that way I don't think about this weird. Okay, I'm not gonna think about that right now. I'm just gonna finish this thing. Okay. And with that said, um, basically that ends um, the lesson for the most part. Basically, the last thing I want to do is just kind of quickly kind of recap what we did. Again, sorry I've just been so jittery tonight. It's just been one of those rough days where everything seems to be kind of weird. Um, but let's just kind of recap really fast. Everything should be fine. So um, basically, polar area was what we were talking about. We were talking about polar area. And we said that unlike with the normal rectangular mode, where everything was based on rectangles of width and height, in this case, we want to think of that the area is adding up a whole bunch of little sectors of a circle. The idea being that those little pizza slices themselves can slowly add up and kind of fit themselves to a polar curve, and then everything works out really nicely. So we talked about first that area of a sector formula, which is one half r squared theta. And then of course, in our case, because we're letting theta be really, really small and creating infinitesimally small little pizza slices, we think of it as d theta. So we started there with that concept, trying to always get you thinking of it as t sums of tiny little slices of pizza. That's how we add up polar area. Yum, yum, pizza, pizza. Everything's good to go. So from there, we looked at a couple different regions and sections and types of problems that could work out. We had the one clean curve se section where we basically used the minimum magnitude angular bound to figure out where the curve starts and stops. We tested up, notice on all these problems, we're always testing with our graphing calculator, taking advantage of the skills that it offers us. Everything seems to be pretty good. So we are working on this first one. When we worked on the first one, we were able to figure out where it crossed itself. We checked it on the computer and then we plugged it into the integral, again, using the calculator to evaluate. On the second one, we were trying to find the area enclosed or between two different curves. Because they didn't intersect, that wasn't difficult. We just took one and then subtracted the other. So it was a different style of question. Um, but again, because they didn't intersect, things worked out really nicely. On our third one, when we tried to work through, there was a common interior question. We were trying to figure out um, the area that was between both of them. And unlike betweenness, where we go top minus bottom or right minus left in the normal way, in this case, geez, thank you, McAfee. In this case, we had to think of it not as like top minus bottom, but as one section to another section to another section. So you'll notice on here, the most important thing I think I did was drawing out the little sectors, like sketching a few sectors and then trying to see in which part of the region or with which curve were those sectors being bounded? Like where was the crust? Which curve made the crust for me? And I was able to get my answer again using the calculator. The calculator really helped out. Then the last one, everything kind of followed the same kind of patterns, except in this case, like I expected it to be one way. I was anticipating a problem where we were going to be adding the two regions together. But as it turned out, because we wanted the shaded region that we saw, when I drew out the pizza slices, I was able to see that I was going from the big part and then having to subtract the smaller white part. So once again, drawing the pizza slices, the number one most important thing. So with that said, long night, happy to be done with this. Hopefully you've enjoyed some part of this lesson. The commercials are probably pretty good. Um, but with that said, I think that that's going to probably end everything for the night. So thank you guys for listening and watching. Um, I hope that you guys have a great rest of your Monday and that you enjoyed some... That was sound. Okay, I wanted to end the lesson here, but it's dumb. I think that I'll feel better if I actually have the camera with me. So here we go. Let's go actually check this out. So I'm going to flip this around. Can I flip it around? No. I'll be okay. So here, just stay with me. I'll be okay. Let's check what we got here. I'm just kind of, let's see, I don't think it was from the bathroom. I don't usually use this. I don't usually use this bathroom. Okay, nothing there. Quick look in the workout room. I don't see anything. Treadmill shoes. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're fine. Okay. I'm not. In the... We're okay. Okay, let's check out the 
Family room. Seems like everything's fine here. We're going just fine. I don't see anything. This is just going to be one of those days where I just like psych myself out. It's like those moments. It's like when you think about a scary idea, sometimes it's actually scarier than actually like just the sounds. Like if you decide to let the sounds at night like bother you, then that's one thing. Hmm. I don't remember putting that there, but okay. So either way, I think we're going to be fine. Everything's good here. So with that said, I can finally wrap up everything. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your night. Have a great day.